OK. Wonderful. Well, welcome everybody. It is uh, 5 PM currently, so I figure we'll get uh, we'll get started. Um, so my name is Nellie Marvel. I am the Outreach and Education Manager at the Cannabis Control Board. Uh, I'm usually uh, sort of behind the camera doing things at these meetings. This is a, a welcome change for me. Um, I am joined tonight by Ray Carre, our licensing agent, one of our licensing agents here at the Cannabis Control Board, uh, Lisa O'Neill, who is Hartford's town clerk, and then um, Kyle Klaus. Is that, did I pronounce your name right, Kyle? Oops, you're muted. No, it's Klaus like Santa. Oh, got it. All right, Kyle Klaus. Um, and uh, our focus tonight is to really talk about navigating local licensing and the interplay between um, the interplay between us here at the state level, CCB, and and the municipality. So you know, we did originally have a representative from a town without a local control commission uh, scheduled for tonight, because of course um, both Hartford and Burlington are. Um, cities with local cannabis control commissions, but uh, she unfortunately had a conflict arise and wasn't able to join us. So uh, I really want to thank our municipal partners uh, for for joining us tonight. This is a really great opportunity to uh, for all of us to kind of share what uh, you know how we've been approaching things on the state level, how um, you know these particular towns have been have been approaching things at the municipal level, share any sort of stumbling blocks, things that have worked well, and how we've all managed to kind of navigate this navigate this together. Um, so I will before we get started uh, flag very quickly that of course there are uh, a lot of municipalities in the state of Vermont. So uh, what Hartford and what Burlington share tonight uh, and what we at the CCB share as our experience of things. Um, what's true for Hartford and Burlington may not be true for, for your town. Um, towns all regulate, uh, you know, zoning and signage and everything like that differently. So, um, you know, there will be time to answer some questions, but uh, I really, I really recommend, you know, uh, reaching out to your town and getting working with them to try to get your your questions answered. Um, so brief brief ground rules before we get started. The uh, chat is open, so this is different than our normal board meetings. Uh, so if you've got any uh, stories to share, um, things that have worked for you uh, navigating this process, go ahead and pop them into the chat. Questions, pop them into the chat also. Um, and this is really an opportunity for our licensees to uh, to connect with each other as well. So you don't necessarily need to wait for you know me or Ray to like pop in and and call on you. If you've got an answer, um, if you've got an answer in the chat for uh, for one of your fellow licensees, please share that information in the chat. Um, we will have opportunity where like we do call on you and invite you to um, you know raise your hand and share things verbally with the rest of the group. Um, we'll let you know when that time when that time comes. Uh, but like I said, the chat is open. Feel free to uh, to share things as they as they come up. So um, I'm going to first turn it over to uh, our towns. Uh, let them let them share their processes and then uh, Ray will share a little bit about things, how we've approached it from the state. So uh, Lisa, how about we how about we start with you first? Thank you. Thank you, Nellie, for including us. If it's OK, I'd like to just give a brief overview of how Hartford came to the place we're in now, and then I'll outline what our process is and then I'm um, happy to answer questions if it's appropriate at that time and feel free to interject at any time. I'm leaving my camera off because I'm operating on my phone, so I don't think you'll get a good shot of me. Um, so just a background, Hartford voters approved our cannabis um, question on our Australian ballot back in March of 2022. And then in July of 2022, our seven member select board established a cannabis control commission, and they are in fact 
the seven members that comprise that cannabis, our local cannabis control board. Um, that commission adopted a policy for reviewing and approving Vermont cannabis permits on the local level in October of 2022. Um, and an application was developed through our town manager's office at that time. And all applications come through the clerk's office. So we push the paper and help coordinate all the parts from the various, both the state level and then from the applicant. And then we um, make sure everyone on the local level is distributed um, the application so the process can begin. So new and renewals for applications are handled the same way. Our policy spells out the details identically. Um, Ray and I will connect at some point in the future to discuss renewals. I know the state's still fleshing out the details there. Um, so we'll be eagerly awaiting how that process will work. But the way it works currently is upon receipt of the preliminary approval from the state, when we receive that notification, that's when our process begins. So then I reach out to the applicant with an application and the complete packet that they would get. We have a cover letter outlining the process. Um, they have an application to complete. And once we receive that back from them, it's reviewed by three departments, um, our zoning administrator, Department of Public Works, and the fire department for fire safety review. For public works, it's for water and wastewater allocations, if that is um, pertinent to that particular application. And obviously for zoning administrator, it's regarding uh, local zoning and or planning permits that may be needed. Once those three departments sign off and we have a complete application from the applicant, we send that to the town manager's office to be placed on the next um, agenda for the local cannabis control board. Depending on the timing, it may not be the one that's happening the next week. It may be two weeks from there. Our board meets every two weeks and the agenda is set the Wednesday before the Tuesday of the meeting. So timing is key and I think it's important for applicants to understand um, those kinds of things, that it's not an immediate thing the minute an application is handed in to us, but we try to keep things moving along as smoothly as we can. Um, applicants are required to attend the meeting of the local control board here in case they have any questions. Currently, our boards meet in a way that um, applicants could attend electronically if they wanted to, if they didn't want to appear in person or weren't available to appear in person. And then once the Cannabis Control Board on the local level takes action, this, we notify the State Cannabis Control Board of you know, that decision, whether it was approved or denied. Um, and then the same is true for the renewal application. They will go through that same process. We'll send that renewal application off to those three departments just for an update to make sure everything is still in compliance as it was when the first license was issued. The, that's basically our nuts and bolts of the process. It's, it's fairly straightforward, but I think the things I would just point out is for a zoning application in Hartford, if it's just an administrative review, then that process is much more quick. If for some reason the venue or the establishment, the location of it needs to go before the zoning board itself, that process can really go anywhere from a month to two months, depending on the timing of the receipt of the application and warning that meeting. So what we would encourage applicants, um, even current licensees to do as they're either doing a new application or a renewal, even before they've done the state process, feel free to go to those departments within Hartford, come see us and speak to our zoning administrator, speak to our Department of Public Works. You can get the ball rolling, even if I don't have an application in my hand. If you wanna fill out the application in advance and have us hold it, we won't submit it to our local cannabis control board until our whole review process has occurred, but you can still have all those pieces ready, either simultaneously while you're doing your state process, or even in advance of that to make sure that the building you're looking at or the location you're in 
um, fits with the zoning um, requirements. Does, does Hartford work for you? We hope it will. Uh, we want this to be a smooth process, um, but I think it is helpful if those things can happen simultaneously so there aren't any del unexpected delays. And each of those departments can also tell you with more specificity what's required of them. As I said, we're pushing the paper, but those departments are the decision makers. Um, and the, the other thing we noticed with one of the applicants that we had, which we didn't necessarily think about, I guess, and I'm not quite sure how the applicant became aware of it, but they were required to get a tobacco license from the Department of Liquor and Lottery. So that comes through the town clerk's office as well and must also go before our local uh, liquor license and follow that policy. The policy is slightly different than the cannabis control policy, but it, it requires for any licenses that go through Department of Liquor and Lottery, it requires for us a background check and a $25 fee for that. Um, and then an application, which includes an additional information sheet. It goes through the Department of Liquor and Lottery new portal. The difference is that the, the first decision, first step is really on the local level, even though you're going to submit your application for a tobacco license through the Department of Liquor and Lotteries portal, the local level makes the decision first, and then it's sent to the state for their final approval. But that um, that cannabis establishment needed to have that to go along with um, their retail activity. And we were not expecting that. So that was a new piece for us. So I just bring that to the attention of anyone who might be listening, because I'm not quite sure how that applicant learned that that was needed. Um, because it didn't come from us. So I don't know if it comes from the state level as they're accessing that process or if they found out some other way. <laughs> so those are two quirky things that um, happened for us. And then the final thing, and, and Nellie and Ray are aware of this, when this all started, there was some confusion at the state level about what constitutes Hartford. <laughs> and we have five villages here. You won't find Hartford generally on a map, but you'll find White River Junction and Queechy and Wilder, but they're not towns and they have no uh, authority. So there was some confusion in the beginning about whether or not applicants had to go before a local cannabis control um, board because White River Junction doesn't have one, but Hartford does. So three of our four applicants have not been through our local process, not applicants, they're licensees now. Um, so another reason I'm particularly curious about the renewal process, because it will be new to them and they'll still be required to go through our um, process. So we'll, we'll try and make that as smooth and comfortable as we can. Um, but we did have a few hiccups. The state's been great about working with us about our concerns and how do we make sure it doesn't happen in the future. So we'll continue to build that working relationship and we want to do the same with the applicants and licensees as well. And I'm done my little spiel unless anyone has questions at this point or if you'd rather wait and do that later. I think let's hold off on uh, questions for the time being. I think we'll turn to Burlington um, next and um, you know, you you guys can uh, can speak to how your process overlaps, differs, specific stumbling blocks, and then maybe um, maybe we can have a, a pause for some questions at that point. And I do see uh, that a couple of guests um, from other municipalities have um, have joined this event. So feel free, those of you who are uh, joining us from other municipalities, uh, if you have anything to add to this as well, please, please, please feel free to uh, to pipe up when we kind of open open the floor for things as well. So uh, Kyle, take it away. Lori's going to start. <laughs> uh, just um, quickly, Lori, I'm the staff person for the subcommittee and then the commission. Um, and a uh, resolution was passed August 15th of last year to form the committee, the commission, and thus the subcommittee. And the subcommittee are members of my license committee. So there's three members. Um, we have a portal, the city has a portal where applicants can go on 
um, and they will put their information in and there's also an application and that will trigger. Um, uh, I will get a notification and then I will be able to put them on to a meeting. Um, I also do get emails from the state, which I appreciate. Thank you um, to uh, keep me aware if there's anything that's coming. Um, when we first started out, it was rather messy, um, but I think that we have a better process. So um, as far as the portal goes, the uh, fire um, zoning and uh, water, they all you know, are looking at this and they have to sign off before it gets to me. So that's how we overall cool. And so members of our uh, local control commission and local control subcommittee, yeah. um, they've expressed some frustration in the last few months about what they feel is an almost illusory discretion over whether or not they can actually uh, grant or deny the local control licenses and what grounds they can do that. Um, so I did some research into it and I mentioned um, slightly before this started to Nelly that, you know, this was really opportune because our members were looking for some guidance. And I think this is a great time, a great time for it for this conversation. Um, it appears, you know, we started to explore the idea of well, what would happen if we were to dissolve our local uh, control commission. And I saw in the chat that there's a few people who I think may be applying for licenses in Burlington. Just to make abundantly clear, the process is still in place. We're just exploring this and seeing if there's, you know, the pros and cons. So what would the city be giving up by way of uh, regulatory tools if we were to dissolve it? And I guess because it's so uh, green, no pun intended, I think, um, you know, the, the, the statute isn't and the rules as well aren't necessarily clear on what the process would be for dissolving a local control commission. But before I get to that, it seemed to me that the the best tool that the municipalities have um, through its local control uh, commissions would be the ability to suspend or revoke a license. Uh, for a violation of any condition placed upon the local control license, which would be compliance with zoning uh, regulations or uh, public nuisance ordinances. Um, so that would be, I think, a, a potent tool for the municipality if you were to have, say, a cultivator who isn't controlling smell well or um, you know, a retailer that puts up a huge garish neon um, sign. I'm sure they would be in trouble with the board as well, but if just for the city to enforce its uh, zoning regulations and public nuisance ordinances, I think the local control license um, and the ability of the commission to suspend or revoke that would be a, a pretty useful tool, but only to the extent, and this is where we could use some more information, what effect would the suspension or revocation have of the local control license, what would that uh, effect that would have on the state issued license? Um, I, I forget which rule it was. Uh, it might have been one or two, but the local control commission is required to notify the board if it does suspend or revoke it. And I doubt the board is just doing that for the fun of it. I'm sure they they may do something with that information. So that's what we hope to to learn today is. What would happen if we were to suspend or revoke a local control license? Great, thank you, Kyle. Um, so I think that actually, uh, Ray, would you want to take that question? Since you are a resident uh, licensing agent, you're muted. Wasn't talking yet. Um, in so far as expanding what uh, municipalities can do to uh, regulate cannabis, it was a deliberate consideration out of the legislature that uh, towns and municipalities uh, not be extended that license and that 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 power. 
uh, specifically within uh, 7 BSA sub uh, section 863, subsection D, uh, firmly uh, prohibits towns and municipalities from engaging in cannabis regulation. That isn't to say that a town and municipality cannot exercise their regulatory authority on land use, zoning, and uh, nuisance rules. And so where a uh, local control commission may feel illusory or authority, uh, they still wield arguably the largest club in the room through the vehicle of their zoning authority. And we have found that municipalities are exercising um, and tailoring their zoning regs and their in their land use regs to conform to the new cannabis industry paradigm. Uh, it still is a, an open question whether towns and municipalities can specifically cite uh, cannabis as a reason to operate a, a, uh, a violation. We, as we read our rules, say that a local government cannot uh, uh, single out cannabis operators, but uh, the municipalities can say a smell, a uh, uh, cultivation type uh, is still subject to land use strictures. And as I, as I mentioned, there are other municipalities exercising that authority presently. Uh, but to get back to the top, I don't think that the board would um, endorse a plan to expand municipal authority to have intermittent uh, uh, revocations of local control permits. That doesn't mean that your referrals for enforcement fall on deaf ears and there is no action. We are absolutely prompt. We are absolutely thorough about town and municipalities flagging um, cannabis operators within their jurisdiction for enforcement. And I, I, I think um, at least the, the public record on that, the uh, media record on that is, is very clear. And I can, I can uh, speak to that being a larger figure uh, internal in how we deal with uh, municipal uh, referrals for enforcement. So I think a, a good question that uh, that came up that Kyle uh, spoke about was the interplay between the local the local permit and then the state the state license. So mm. if a municipality finds that uh, a licensee is um, in violation of its uh, its ordinances on you know signage uh, zoning public nuisance what have you and they opt to um, under that authority uh, opt to rescind a, a license um, and then they send that information to the state that hey we've gotten rid of like this person no longer holds a local a local permit from us because we've found them to be in violation of of these things what then does the CCB do with that information um, regarding that person's state license? So when that licensee goes in for renewal and it is clear that they are not going to have a uh, local uh, local permit to operate, uh, that license is, a, is effectively suspended um, until they can find a way to be compliant with their local authority. So. In the example of a cannabis retailer that's on Church Street that offends uh, any number of the nuisance uh, uh, ordinances and regulations in Burlington, Burlington rescinds their local permit. When they come back up for renewal, they'll have to close up shop if uh, if after a compliance in, in inspection and, and uh, board review, uh, we've determined that their their license is no longer viable under those uh, under those really narrow uh, conditions and yeah that's the way we understand it i would just um, i just want to add because we are joined by a member of our our local control commission uh, and subcommittee 
uh, city councilor Joan Shannon. She just dropped a message in the chat, and I hope I'm not stepping on your toes by reading from the chat, but since she wasn't able to join us here, I just wanted to, to share her concern. She said, we are also concerned about the secrecy around the applicants and the fact that even their address is redacted, which obstructs transparency in the process. If you're allowed to opt in or opt out, why can we not further regulate if we opt in? We've been told we can't zone cannabis specifically. And I think, Ray, that that speaks to what you mentioned earlier about, you know, singling can cannabis establishments out. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. There is some interesting um, interaction with how our confidentiality rule operates against um, uh, DRB review, that, that is a, a review board um, uh, assessment of, of where to place a development review board, that is to say, uh, review of how um, businesses are uh, put to public scrutiny. So there, the, the, the secrecy issue is, um, is, is, is less burdensome from our perspective when uh, seen through the uh, development review board lens. Um, I'm not really seeing a question that Joan really wants asked in so in, in insofar as as how to interpret the confidentiality rule. Um, a, a, Sorry, yes, Lori. Um, if you could just give some more, um, maybe just to go off on the the rationale behind the the confidentiality requirements. So, primarily, and this isn't as specifically for retailers. And I see Lisa's hand up, so I'm going to answer this question quickly and then um, uh, address uh, what Lisa has to ask. Um, the confidentiality uh, uh, statute, as we understand it, is a public safety measure uh, for the cannabis operator themselves. Uh, looking at how our sister states have um, launched their cannabis industries, they have found that uh, property crime follows the publicizing of cannabis operators, whether they are retailers or manufacturers or wholesalers, and that makes them a, a vulnerable target, even with their security systems. And that's something that we in Vermont really want to avoid, uh, given our our uh, a rural environment and the fact that um, if we have a relatively easy tool to conceal uh, who is who is a potential target, we're going to take that opportunity. Um, I think that's all so I think Lisa will turn to you and then we've got some questions and comments that are in the chat. So um, we'll turn to those next. But Lisa, how about you go ahead? Thank you. This will be very brief. It goes back to uh, zoning and violations and that sort of thing. We um, had a situation where an applicant was issued the permit, but by state statute, there's a 15 day waiting period before they're able to move forward. It's public review, you know, you put the P in your window, <laughs> that sort of thing. So every permit that's issued, there's a 15 day waiting period. I had to wait for it when I established and, and installed our uh, secure ballot box at our town hall. I had to wait 15 days before we could actually open it and use it. Um, so the applicant received this permit, and there's a 15 day waiting period and in an effort to make that clear to the state, I highlighted that when I submitted everything. And yet within 48 to 72 hours, that business was operating. Um, and based on our somewhat limited experience and uh, some of the bumpy experience we had, our zoning administrator opted not to um, contest that technical violation, but we brought it to the state's attention in hopes that the state would hold off until that 15 day period had expired and that didn't happen. So I'm curious as to why and how do we avoid that happening in the future? Because it puts the local level 
it puts us in a precarious position when the process to an applicant might already seem pretty arduous and long. And then there's a 15 day waiting period when they're eager to open and we're not trying to put stumbling blocks in there, but every other business is held to that standard. And so our hope was the state would recognize by us highlighting that they would recognize that state requirement and not issue the license until or put some condition on it saying, as of this date, you may open your doors. And that didn't happen. And we obviously didn't contest it with this applicant. We wanted the applicant to have as good experience as possible. But in a nutshell, basically, um, the zoning administrator really could have if if they had wanted to, but um, just didn't have the bandwidth for that after the process we'd been through. Yeah, this is the first I'm hearing of the uh, of a 15 day waiting period between uh, permitting and, and opening one's doors. Um, so I, I can't uh, speak to that directly. Um, but I'm happy to return to this question and, and give a more uh, thoughtful and substantive answer on behalf of the agency. And I'll try and send you the state statute because I, I don't I'm not a zoning administrator, but let me get that and then I'll just share it with you and and yeah. um we'll go from there. Thank you very much. No worries. Uh, same. I am not a zoning admin either. Um so we have uh, a couple of comments in uh in the chat. Uh Jason Struthers from Tricombe Vermont um, says that it's his understanding municipalities have no jurisdiction over cultivation or manufacturing. Um, municipalities, however, don't see it that way, and they're asking who has jurisdiction and um, also talking a little bit about the state of Vermont not recognizing cannabis as an agricultural product, but um, municipality says that cannabis can only be cultivated in agricultural zones. So I can I can speak to this a little bit because this um, this particular zoning issue about how to um, how to reg whether or not to regulate cannabis as an agricultural product or an industrial product. Um, cannabis's definition in state law, it not being an agricultural product, is a separate issue from um, from zoning. There's nothing in state law. Uh, specific to zoning that states um, that cannabis must be zoned agricultural, zoned anything particularly. Zoning is under a municipality's um, authority to regulate. It's very squarely under a municipality's zoning to, uh, to regulate. So, um, you know, that whole, that whole definition of uh, cannabis is not an agricultural product. It's actually fairly uh, as a, a fairly specific uh, use. It's actually pretty specifically uh, pretty specifically applies to certain tax benefits that um, that folks who farm agricultural products um, have access to that uh, that cannabis cultivators um, don't may not necessarily have access to because the particular crop that they are growing is cannabis, which is not defined as an agricultural product under that particular portion of state law. Um, you know, they're not to get too far off off course here. There is a carve out for uh, for tier one um, cannabis cultivators that they can uh, they have access to some of those some of those benefits, but that's a separate issue from from the zoning issue. Um, towns can towns can choose to zone cannabis, um, and they just you know that needs to be uh, consistent across uh, across cannabis cultivation businesses. Um, but but that's a separate issue than um, than cannabis's definition under state law. Um, I don't know if the municipal if the municipalities that have joined us uh, want to speak to that particular issue at all. Or if they feel like I've just summed it up well enough. There we go. I think we'll take a pass on this one. Okay, fine. Um, 
let's see. So that kind of addresses the two, the two, the kind of slightly differing um, definitions on uh, on zoning. Um, let's see what else we have. Um, what what Malcolm is asking. What recourse is there for cannabis businesses when municipalities single out cannabis in the regulations and those regulations flout state law? Um, what also the local processes involve uh, post publicly posting otherwise redacted information um, and asking what is the state uh, what is the state doing to have the municipalities honor that part of the law? So I think we've we've been in touch with municipalities about our read of um, that particular section of state law, especially as it concerns confidentiality. And we can't particularly comment on uh, specific instances, really. Um, Ray, do you have anything further to add on that? Yeah, uh, uh, generally the uh, CCB wants to make clear that um, we don't want to put ourselves into an advocacy position uh, in, in, in the context of uh, uh, providing legal uh, guidance to uh, either licensees or municipalities uh, on how to strategize uh, their interactions with licensees. Uh, we don't provide uh, advice on how to um, contest or 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 vindicate uh, one's perceived rights on a perceived wrong. Uh, what we what we are more than happy to be is uh, a point of contact between uh, licensees and municipalities and municipalities and the licensees. And um, any any guidance that we do offer, it is in interpretation of our rules and how the statutes inform our rules and how we uh, interpret the statutes that give us authority. Uh, specifically being that um, there was a previous question about who has jurisdiction. Uh, the, squarely, the CCB has jurisdiction over all cannabis establishments. Is is our reserved jurisdiction. This is a Dillon rule state. That is how we see our authorizing language. That is to say that we do not interfere with towns zoning, nuisance, or land use authorities. And where a town sees uh, a, a place to um, fit in the new cannabis industry paradigm, uh, they are well, well within their authority to draft new rules, again, that do not specifically uh, address cannabis as it would uh, countermand, as we see it, Section 863, Subsection D, that is a black letter prohibition on that. Uh, so Malcolm, I see you have your hand raised and that was your uh, that was your chat there. Um, did you have anything to add further to that? I do, if I may, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. Firstly, for having this session and having the people invited here today, I, I, we really all appreciate this because this helps to shine a little clarity on it. Um, I don't think uh, cultivators, specifically in the way of cannabis businesses, are asking for any advocacy on the part of the state. I think that the admitted gray area that was mentioned before with respect to how municipalities are to interpret uh, the law is sort of still unclaimed in the way of legal ground. So that's sort of a gray area. So so I think my question more precisely is that then falls upon cultivators to fight some of these towns on a legal basis to figure this law out as opposed to the CCB, the state or legislators or someone else. I mean, the point is we're a social equity company, my own company, and we will be going out of business because we don't simply have the money to contest with some of the, the town that we're dealing with, with respect to their basic belligerency with respect to the law and the way they're sort of establishing new regulations. So we're sort of not asking for your advocacy, but I'd rather ask, are we just being hung out to dry? And then in the end, I guess multi-million dollar companies will step in and actually take over the cultivation aspect of Vermont cannabis. 
It is our experience that the lumpen majority of municipalities have been more than uh, uh, open to the new cannabis industry paradigm. And while not all municipalities will respond in exactly the same way, uh, we'll start with the easiest question to answer. Are you being hung out to dry? Absolutely not. We are uh, bound by our mission, which is as cannabis regulators, um, and those licensees who find themselves in a position where they feel um, the weight of a municipal uh, authority that um, is given to process and protocol, um, that that is a, uh, a dispute that will have to be resolved in the courts where the, the, the board just does not have standing uh, to uh, restrain a municipality that is on that line of, uh, of, of trying to regulate cannabis. Yeah, I, I hear you, and I, I don't mean to make this a back and forth, but the CCB has incredible influence over legislation that is coming out. Um, and mm -hmm. nowhere did we see the extension of the Tier 1 allowance that was covered in Act 158 extended to all outdoor tiers. This has been something that we've seen coming down the pike for some time. We've been asking for the advocacy, mm -hmm. advocacy groups on the call here tonight have all been asking for that. And that was just mysteriously not in the in the in the uh the suggestions i won't call it advocacy but in the ccb suggestions to the legislature which they take as gold so the reality is is that sure you can't advocate but if something like that were to be included in your suggestions then that would better protect the cultivators around the state that are actually an integral part of the whole market right I agree with your assessment that the cultivators are an integral part and we are doing our level best to uh, develop that part of our cannabis industry. Uh, to your point about advocating on behalf of uh, uh, amendments to existing statute, we are one of many stakeholders in this process. And while the legislature has been very receptive to what CCB needs, uh, to effectively regulate this market. Um, there are scores of other stakeholders who have differing opinions about how uh, cannabis ought to be uh, uh, designated, especially when considered uh, against an, uh, other agricultural products or agricultural adjacent products. Well, thank you. All right. This seems, like, this seems like a good opportunity to maybe open up the floor um, to other folks who may want to ask questions. Um, so we'll handle this sort of similarly to we do our normal board meetings. If you have a question, raise your virtual hand. We'll call on you. Um, we do have one person that's joined via phone, and we'll um, have some time there as well to, uh, to uh, turn to folks on the phone as well. Um, so first up, we have Sarah. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you all so much for hosting this session. It's super helpful. Um, I'm coming from the planning and zoning world, and we're talking to planners around the state, and there's there's been a lot of confusion. Um, as, as planning and zoning folks, we understand that towns have the authority to establish standards that are specific to certain kinds of businesses like a kennel or a junkyard or a bed and breakfast um and so if towns have the authority to regulate cannabis establishments in the same way that they're regulating every other kind of business it seems like you should be able to develop general standards or conditional use standards that are specific to cannabis establishments maybe even different kinds of cannabis establishments it sounds like your position is different from that there's a lot of confusion around that around the state and i'd be grateful if you could speak to that point thank you Do you want to take a stab at that, Ray, or yeah, I can? No, um... I've got it. I've got it. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, 
cover some some already trodden ground. The way that the Cannabis Control Board uh, looks at our authorizing language, <clears throat> we see it as a hard stop on municipalities regulating cannabis. Uh, that isn't to say that we're uh, we're trying to stray into a town's authority to uh, regulate their own land use, nuisance, and zoning regs. Yeah, and I, I will say also that um, it is specifically called out in, in state law that um, towns can't zone in a way that would have an, the effect of um, essentially prohibiting cannabis establishments from, from operating um, in their towns, but, uh, you know, does give does give uh, municipalities, um, you know, otherwise their their regular authority uh, for for zoning. All right, so we have uh, Graham is next. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, Nelly. My name is Graham Yuneng Strufenacht. I'm the policy director at Rural Vermont. We're a 35 year old uh, member based agricultural advocacy organization in the state, one of the three largest in the state. Um, in terms of a recommendation, a man earlier asked for recommendations. And as a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, which includes the Northeast Organic Farmers Association of Vermont, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, Vermont Growers Association, the Green Mountain Patients Alliance, I think we would all recommend the municipalities treat all forms of outdoor production as agriculture. Uh, now, in terms of what the person wrote in the chat earlier, which we, uh, about the town restricting production just to agricultural land, that's not what that means. It just means that towns would essentially, all the tiers of outdoor production and the mixed tier of outdoor production would be treated as tier one outdoor production is currently treated in law. And until we achieve that, the legislative level has been discussed tonight, that is within town's purview to do. Um, and I've spoken to many businesses whose livelihoods are under threat right now because of towns choosing to try to do otherwise. Um, farms are under a lot of economic stress as it is. People trying to diversify, people trying to get into farming through this. This is a really important thing for towns to think about. Um, and just to illustrate one strange example of, of how weird this gets, you know, you have people who are cultivating hemp on their farm. They've been doing that for years. Um, now they want to cultivate the exact same plant that has a different chemical makeup and they're being told that the smell of the same plant leaving their property boundary could be a problem. Just think about that for a minute. <clears throat> um, so the second thing I guess I would say is just to reiterate that I think there's a lot of confusion and that statute that Nelly just referenced uh, says per 7 VSA 863D, towns may not create local bylaws or ordinances that have the effect of prohibiting the operation of a cannabis establishment. Yet that's juxtaposed with the statements that have been made about, you know, zoning and municipal authority related to zoning being explicitly permitted in law. And it's clear that for these cannabis establishments and municipal bodies, this is very confusing. And what I think Malcolm was pointing out earlier is that currently the the burden of that, of figuring out what's going to happen legally, is going to fall on disproportionately on small businesses that are confronting towns that are being difficult. Um, so it's just a, a problem we need to to figure out, not just for how outdoor production is treated as agriculture at the town level and nationally. We have are getting on calls with our federal delegation to seek that. Um, but this two-tiered regulatory system is really problematic, and I think we need to think. Uh, differently about this. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. All right, I know we have um, a couple of folks, or I believe we have a couple of folks um, from other um, municipalities that have uh, joined. I don't know if anybody else wanted to sort of pipe up and uh, talk about how um, how your town maybe has been handling this, some of these issues that have uh, that have come up um, or speak to how um, and this is not to put you on the spot. Anybody who has joined that doesn't feel uh, as though they have a place uh, to say anything right now, it's fine, um, but just giving an opportunity. Uh, so I see we have the town of Paulette here. Hi there, thank you. It's Nancy Morlino. I'm the zoning administrator in the town of Paulette. Paulette, we consider ourselves a, a cannabis-friendly town. 
We don't dictate what zones cannabis can be grown in. Uh, we do have one classification, which I believe is a state classification, and that is that it cannot be grown in a designated agricultural building. So we've had a situation in town where um, a greenhouse was constructed a number of years ago. It was permitted as an agricultural building at that time. There is a desire to have that now designated as an indoor growing facility. And we have requested that they remove, that the applicant remove that agricultural designation from that facility. But as far as where it can be grown, again, we don't dictate it can be grown in an ag zone, it can be grown in a commercial zone. And I was wondering if you could just comment as to the status of um, ag designated structures as indoor growing facilities. Again, it's, it's our understanding and through conversations with the Department of Ag that those structures can't be used for indoor facilities designated as such. They could be re-permitted and removed from that agricultural uh, nomenclature. Thank you. So it's not uh, it's not the CCB doesn't uh, doesn't offer doesn't tell uh, towns how to sort of apply these different uh, zoning zoning regulations. We can't really be in the position of of telling folks how to how to regulate uh, that. I, I do recommend if you have municipal council reaching out to them or um, you know, I know the League of Cities and Towns has been has been a resource for a lot of municipalities and sort of facilitating those connections with other towns, sort of see how um, how other places have been regulating uh, have been regulating this. Um, you know, we have we have definitions and our rules about what counts as a, a greenhouse that's indoor uh, as an indoor cultivator versus like what types of structures might be able to count as outdoor cultivation but we don't um we don't get into it much beyond beyond that that radio anything to add there no that that's that's the thrust of it nelly yeah. um okay great and I guess I will add that um, whatever the town of Paulet does decide on how to proceed with uh, what requirements they have for their licensees, we are absolutely emphatic encouragers of those uh, of our licensees to be compliant with how towns see the see those kinds of uh, license or sorry uh, zoning restrictions. So we do have um, some folks that have joined via phone, so I do want to give them an opportunity to ask any questions if they have them. So uh, anyone who's joined via phone, you can press star six to unmute and you can ask questions that way. So I'll just pause for a moment and allow those who have joined by phone to ask questions if they have any. Okay, seeing none. Um, does anyone else have any other um, anything else to add, or any other questions from the public? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that this this event in particular has really helped to underscore is this is still like. Vermont's regulated cannabis market is still very much in its infancy. Um, there are a number of, of points that we are still in the process of working out, of figuring out what those pain points are, and then figuring out a way for us to all work together as, as partners moving forward to, to navigate these systems. You know, we we very much um at least very much at the state level want to work to um 
facilitate these connections and have a, a cooperative relationship between the state, the municipality, and licensees rather than um, you know, an adversarial one. And there will be there will be pain points that come up and sticking points that come up, but you know, we're all going to try to work together to navigate to navigate those. Um, Malcolm, I see you have um, your hand raised again. Yeah, thank you. Um, I I just wanted to say again, the I, I thank you guys also for doing this, um, for having this meeting, for having these discussions. I think it's quite helpful, and I think what it illuminates most is that that gray area in the law is there, and that doing nothing about it it's going to fall on the cultivators and the small businesses heads so the point is even if we wait a year a year and a half it may do in and of itself enough to knock out enough of those businesses that it creates a big enough hole where you know dispensaries and other entities can say hey we don't have the product we need so then they'd have to open these larger tiers up and let bigger businesses in so my point is it's not it's it's you're not we're not being neutral on a moving train, so to speak here, right? Like this is this is actually moving in a direction by not doing anything about clarifying those gray areas. And either which way it goes, it's fine. But um, because I do believe in 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 the uh, the local ability to control land. I mean, that's within reasonable bounds and makes sense. You know, you don't want to divert waterways, et cetera. But um, the bigger picture is is that they can abuse these local land use regulations to basically and essentially live out their contrived beliefs about cannabis. And so just one last thing as a social equity company, this is happening now exactly what the idea of social equity was to sort of help marginalize communities, et cetera. This is systemic uh, 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 marginalization of the same community happening right before our eyes, actually. And again, sitting beside doing nothing about it, we'll see the result of that. And I hope we don't see the result of that. But again, thank you guys for having this. I appreciate um, the discussion. Yes, thank you, thank you, Malcolm, for um, for sharing your concerns. You know, we certainly do want this to be an equitable market that works that works for everybody. Um, you know, and I will say as far as any gray areas that exist in law, you know, this goes for everybody, everybody on this call, um, you know, state regulators, municipal regulators, licensees, advocacy organizations, um, you know, be in touch with your legislators, talk to them about what's working for you, what's not working for you. Um, you know, the role of the CCB is to operationalize what is in state law. Um, so that is that is how we approach our job here is we look at what's what's in the uh, what's in state law and we write our rules in a way to put that into into practice. Um, so with that, it is 559 currently. I want to give um, our municipal partners one last opportunity to say uh, give any closing remarks that they might have or any last uh, parting thoughts before we before we wrap this thing up. I just want to say thank you uh, for having us, and I'm sure this is the start of a of a longer conversation. Um, but yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I would echo Kyle's comments and just say thank you for keeping the door open for us um, as we run into various stumbling blocks and as we. Um, get a little more familiar and acclimated so that applicants and licensees have a good experience as well as municipal staff who are navigating these waters so that everyone has a good experience and the licensees, uh, once they're established, can be successful to Malcolm's point. You know, you you want businesses to be successful once you get them through the process. And although I'm not a zoning administrator, I can't speak to how Hartford's looking at it, but I right now I'm not aware that we're doing anything to try and regulate things differently. Um, we have a very experienced staff here in Hartford, um, both the zoning administrator and the planning director. So my hope is that will help folks who come to Hartford get through that part of the process. And thank you again.
And if I may, I want to thank all of our municipal partners. Uh, the, the gross majority of Vermont's cities and towns of, of the towns that do have uh, local control commissions really do understand the assignment, really do understand uh, their role in uh, this new cannabis industry paradigm. Uh, it, it is unfortunate that there are uh, growing pains as, as have been voiced tonight, um, but by and large, our municipal partners have been outstanding to work with and uh, like on behalf of the Cannabis Control Board to express my gratitude. Thank you. All right. And with that, it's 601. I'm going to call this thing. Thank you. Thank you again, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. This has been um, a really, a really constructive conversation. All right. Take care, everyone.